Alright, this video looks at children and young athletes. This is the first dot point under how does sports medicine address the demands of specific athletes. Now here we have to look at um, children and young athletes in terms of their medical conditions, so things like asthma, diabetes, epilepsy. Uh, we also need to think about their overuse injuries because they're growing and developing and so that becomes a major thing with uh, children and young athletes as well. We need to think about them in terms of their thermoregulation because it's not as developed as it is in adulthood. And we also have to think about uh, whether or not resistance training is appropriate for them and if so, uh, how should it be uh, adapted in order to make sure that it's uh, suitable for them. Uh, with this learn about, you also have to do stuff with it. That's what our learn to tells us. So you need to be able to analyse the implications of each of these considerations for the ways young people engage in sport and how it's managed. So how the medical conditions actually affect the way we engage in sport and then how do we manage each of those conditions. Uh, the first medical condition we need to have, make sure we have a decent understanding of is asthma. So asthma, uh, it's a medical condition of the airways and essentially a normal airway is nice and open, it's fairly thin, uh, whereas people with asthma, um, once they have their um, trigger that occurs, so whether that be pollen or maybe even exercise can induce asthma, uh, the walls of the bronchi, they start to uh, swell up, they become thick, uh, mucus starts to uh, excrete into the airway and it makes it really difficult for them to breathe. Uh, and so we need to think about how that's going to affect uh, our young children and young athletes as they participate in sport and then how what we should do to manage it. So the implications, uh, basically they should avoid their known triggers. So if they know that dust or pollen or something is a trigger, then they should kind of avoid places where there's going to be lots of dust, like dirt bike riding or something like that. Uh, if they've got exercise-induced asthma, there's lots of different ways to manage that. Um, but essentially, um, if with exercise-induced asthma, the asthma attack is going to be as big uh, as the intensity of the exercise. And so if they do a nice, uh, decent, proper warm-up, that will help reduce uh, the severity of the attack if they have it. Uh, and then gives them um, this period of time where they can't have another attack. Uh, so it's kind of, um, yeah, it's very key there to look after them and give them their proper warm-up. And again, just being well prepared, making sure they've got their uh, Ventolin or their reliever puffer uh, on hand in case they do have an asthma attack. Make sure that they're on any kind of um, preventative medication if they need to be on that. Uh, their, their asthma should be well managed before they uh, do exercise. Uh, in terms of managing uh, asthma, asthma management plans should be in place. Uh, some people have individual ones, other people just use generic ones. Uh, but generally speaking, there should be some kind of asthma management plan. What are we going to do if this child has an attack? Uh, what are they doing to prevent it? Uh, and then how does our sport or our exercise fit into that? Uh, always having that Ventolin or reliever puffer um, available so that they can take the, their treatment, their first aid if it's required, if they have an attack. Uh, and the person supervising them, or at least a person supervising them, uh, should have their first aid certificate, particularly uh, being out, being trained in the delivery uh, and treatment of asthma uh, attacks. So uh, we can see down here on the right-hand side, and you've got to sit the person up, make sure they're generally careful, give them four puffs um, of their reliever puffer. So you want to use a spacer when you're doing that, Shake, make sure you shake the puffer, uh, one puff into the spacer, four breaths, and you're going to repeat that uh, until four puffs have been taken uh, done. Uh, and then you're going to wait four minutes. If there's no, um, hasn't gotten better, you'll start to repeat the process and you'll call an ambulance. The next medical condition is diabetes. Now, there's two types of diabetes. Uh, there's type 1, also known as early onset diabetes or insulin dependent diabetes. But essentially, type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disorder uh, where the pancreas no longer produces insulin properly. Um, and so they require insulin injections uh, and it's very important for type 1 diabetics uh, that their timing of their insulin injections is not before or after exercise because exercise itself will open up uh, our body cells, uh, our muscle cells and will essentially do what insulin does um, for our body. Type 2 diabetes is the other type. It's also known as you know, late onset diabetes. Uh, this is the lifestyle disease that uh, is growing in Australia. Uh, it is about insulin resistance, so essentially what's happened is that your body uh, has re needed so much insulin uh, to 
continuously reduce uh, your blood glucose levels. So it keeps releasing insulin. Insulin keeps going to the receptors that are on your cells to open up your cells so that the glucose that's in your blood can transfer into the cell. And so when your body uh, releases all that insulin, eventually the receptors don't respond very well to the insulin. It's kind of like uh, the key has been put in and out of the lock so many times that the lock doesn't start to doesn't work properly anymore. Um, so the insulin comes it's trying to open the cell. Uh, you then require high levels of insulin to then open the cell and to get that blood glucose down. Uh, and eventually it turns into type 2 diabetes where um, the blood glucose levels actually aren't going down fast enough. Uh, and so it gets uh, diagnosed as type 2 diabetes. So our implications. Uh, so physical activity, as I mentioned earlier, lowers blood glucose levels. So that means that when you do exercise, your blood glucose levels start to drop because your muscle cells open up from the inside. They don't need insulin to open. It just opens up by itself and your blood glucose starts to go into your muscles. So if you have someone who is an insulin dependent diabetic, that type 1 diabetes, then that person, uh, they, if they take their insulin before exercise, then the insulin is going to lower their blood glucose levels Exercise is then going to lower it even further and you're going to end up with someone who needs uh, some uh, particular first aid treatment for their hypoglycemia. Uh, and the same for afterwards. If you do exercise, which lowers your blood glucose levels, and then you take uh, your insulin shot, again, you're going to have blood glucose levels that are too low and start to become dangerous. Uh, so it's important for people with type 1 diabetes uh, that they actually probably want to look at um, eating some kind of foods with their exercise, either side of it, maybe during it, depending on how long their exercise is. Uh, but it's about just maintaining and managing uh, the blood glucose levels. And so uh, often people with type 1 diabetes will have uh, blood glucose testers. And so they'll just give themselves a quick prick and have a test. And if their, glu uh, if their glucose levels are low, then they can eat something uh, to get it back up. And if they're high, they can do some exercise or they can take an insulin injection to get that back down. Uh, physical activity can also be used to help manage type 2 diabetes. Because physical activity opens the muscle cells from the inside, and that means that you don't need the insulin. So uh, a type 2 diabetic person whose insulin isn't working properly uh, can help reduce their blood sugar levels simply by going and doing some physical activity to open up the muscle cells. And then all that glucose will travel into the muscle tissue uh, where it can be used for energy. Uh, and allows the body to not need insulin and as your body then uses less and less insulin and then starts to respond better when the insulin is used. In terms of the management for diabetes, we have two scenarios that can come up for a diabetic. One is hyperglycemia, which is high blood glucose levels, and one's hypoglycemia, which is low blood glucose levels. So if we have someone who has low blood glucose levels, essentially uh, they're going to be really, really tired, really lethargic, kind of like you are when you're really hungry. And so they're going to be a bit anxious, they might sweat a bit, uh, their heart rate's going to get a bit rapid, and they're going to essentially, they might feel dizzy, they might um, actually lose consciousness, um, they might black out, all kinds of stuff um, can happen with low blood glucose. And so uh, in order to treat that, you want to give them some kind of um, sugar to help raise up those blood glucose levels. So that can be, um, you know, some kind of cordial uh, it could be a juice, it could be uh, some jelly beans, often uh, people with diabetes have jelly beans on them uh, or in their bag or something for emergencies. Uh, the other problem that uh, can happen is the hyperglycemia, so if they have too much uh, glucose in their bloodstream. And with this, uh, our signs are that they get really uh, thirsty, they need to urinate a lot, uh, they can get quite irritable and cranky. Um, and so in order to treat someone like this, uh, who might, you know, they might also have a dry mouth or something, uh, they need to reduce their blood glucose levels so they can go and do a little bit of physical activity or uh, they might need an insulin injection uh, to make sure that they manage that. Our next medical condition is epilepsy. Uh, epilepsy essentially uh, is a condition in your brain where uh, your neurons misfire, causes you to lose control over your body for a period of time. Uh, and that can be really big uh, loss of control. So uh, you could start waving your arms around all over the place. You could start... Um, shaking around, you could go really tense, it can be really obvious, but it can also be really uh, non-obvious, uh, hard to spot, so it could be someone who just kind of blacks out for a moment, uh, someone who uh, starts to hear things or see things that aren't quite there because it's about uh, the neurons sending messages to each other uh, about things that, that doesn't need to do um, or about things that aren't there. It's just that compli complication, kind of like a, a crossing over of the wires, so to speak, in the brain which causes uh, the misfiring of neurons. The implications of epilepsy. 
Um, it's very important for someone who has epilepsy, particularly a child, uh, to make sure that there's someone else present. Uh, nothing worse than having an epileptic uh, episode, a seizure or something, uh, and there being no one around. Uh, so it, we want to make sure that there's someone present to look after them, uh, someone or hopefully who's trained in their first aid again, uh, who can kind of cushion their head and make sure that that person's not going to bang their head on something uh, and then move things out of the way so they're not going to hurt themselves and then reassure them, calm them afterwards, uh, maybe call an ambulance if it lasts too long, etc. Uh, someone with epilepsy also should know their triggers. So uh, some triggers can be lights, uh, flashing lights or something. Uh, various triggers uh, exist for different people uh, that might stimulate or make them more likely to have a seizure. And so it's important for people to know what those triggers are and then to select sports accordingly, make sure that they're not picking sports. They're going to have lots of flashing lights in them, like dancing or something where we're going to have lights uh, going on and off the stage according to the music or anything. Uh, if that's something that's likely to cause them to have an epileptic uh, episode or a seizure or something, you want to make sure that they don't um, participate uh, in a sport like that. Um, I'm not saying that they can't, uh, it just means that they're a lot more likely to have a seizure at the end of it. Uh, you also want to be um, cautious with them if they want to choose to do uh, sports that would be dangerous if they started having a seizure during it. So there are things like water sports. So I remember being a lifeguard at a leisure centre and there was uh, a kid in squads who was epileptic. And that's fine, you know, he was epileptic, he was in squads, he enjoyed the sport, he was having a great time. But there was about a month or two months where he was having uh, seizures every single time he got into that pool. Uh, and so after... A couple of weeks, we took him out and then uh, of squads, and then he went back again a couple of weeks later, and uh, he had another seizure. And so it was very important for him during that time that there was someone watching him the whole time, making sure uh, that the second that uh, that seizure started to happen, there was someone in the pool making sure that he was head was out of it, that he could breathe, that he was fine. Uh, and so you want to do the same thing with something like horse riding or uh, riding bikes, particularly motorbikes and stuff. Uh, if you're going to have a seizure at 80 kilometers an hour and fall off the bike, it's it's a bit dangerous, uh, so you want to make sure that the epilepsy is uh, well taken care of, well monitored, well um, looked after by um, medical specialists uh, before they start to consider sports like that, uh, particularly if triggers are things that exist in those sports. The management of epilepsy, so basically supervise uh, the actual seizure, so make sure that uh, they're not going to bang their head, that they're not going to hit their arms or legs into anything if it's one of those kinds of seizures. Uh, if they're going to, if they fall into the ground or something, uh, you might hopefully catch them, depending on where you are. You know, uh, lower them down. Uh, if the seizure lasts for more than five minutes, you're going to start. You want to make sure you call an ambulance uh, and make sure someone gets there to care for them afterwards. Uh, once the seizure finishes, reassure them, look after them, be calm. Uh, you don't want to like get all stressed out. Uh, one of the main things with epilepsy is to make sure that the people, the bystanders. Uh, maintain their distance and that they're calm as well because the person once they come to is going to be fairly embarrassed uh, because people are standing around watching so you want to make sure that you manage all those things uh, within sport so uh, there are some implications there for epilepsy and sport it can be some sports can be dangerous and so just using wisdom using medical guidance um, and also making sure that the athlete themselves uh, they know their triggers they know if they're um, being looked after and stuff and they generally speaking won't put themselves at more risk than they need to.